The 1960s are upon us. To say that this decade was turbulent would be an understatement. When I think of the 1960s, I see a time where everything was questioned by the generations that are coming of age. In other words, counterculture has formed where norms were flipped upside down, including tastes and in clothes, food, entertainment, that includes music, literature, film and television. With issues like civil rights being withheld from marginalized groups, drafting people to fight a war in a land they know nothing about, and witnessing a presidential assassination, a person can't help but question why these things are happening and do whatever it takes to change the status quo. Well, all of this provides a lot of juicy allegory for creative science fiction writers to take said issues and apply them to fictional worlds of humanity where they, or perhaps alien races, deal with something similar without them being too heavy-handed. The 1960s should be credited with further building a science fiction following with television shows like Lost in Space, Star Trek, and The Twilight Zone. Film, on the other hand, was still slow to take in the science fiction genre with many studio executives, A, not understanding the many cerebral concepts that come with the genre, and B, the insane costs and work it takes to craft a film that requires pure imagination. Well, one day an ambitious producer came across a French novel about a man who finds himself on a planet where an upside down civilization has occurred, making mankind the lowest on the primate totem pole. Is it possible for mankind to regress so much they leave a power vacuum inviting another order of primate to become the dominant species of the world? That, my friends, is answered in the timeless, cautionary science fiction classic, Planet of the Apes. My first exposure to the original Planet of the Apes was probably witnessing my dad watching it one weekend afternoon in the late 80s or early 90s when I was like four or five years old, and recall the scene where we see the chimpanzees for the first time. I thought they were so damned ugly and weird looking that I ran out of the room. Years later, when I was 11 or 12, I rediscovered the original film again on a WGN noon broadcast, watching the portion with the apes, and I remember seeing how it ended, and the dark nature of it captivated me. I asked my dad if there were any sequels, and he told me that there actually were, to my surprise. So I rented them on VHS from my local video store periodically for a few years, while playing Donkey Kong 64 and Diddy Kong Racing as well. I ended up owning the reissued VHS releases in the late 90s when I was in high school and as I got older, these films got more and more captivating with my maturing brain, unlocking more and more of the themes as I rewatched. At the same time, the Mark Wahlberg remake came out and I enjoyed it despite its problems, but more on that for a future Apes retrospective. Like Star Wars, Star Trek, and the Alien franchise before it, Planet of the Apes became another franchise that built my interest and further love for science fiction and the thoughtful and interesting themes and ideas that came with it. Let's go back in time to see how this groundbreaking film ever managed to see the light of day. The project originated with its source material, a novel by acclaimed author of The Bridge of the River Kwai, Pierre Boulle, called Le Planet des Songes, or Monkey Planet. The film rights found itself in the hands of Hollywood producer Arthur P. Jacobs of App Jack Productions, 
who was currently producing several pictures at the time. He was really interested in the challenges of bringing that book to life and hired legendary Twilight Zone creator Rod Serling to write several drafts of the script. Certain things from the original novel could not be translated to screen, like the final twist and the original setting due to budgetary reasons. Serling wrote as many as 30 drafts in the course of a year. Jacobs tried to pitch the film to all the major studios with script in hand along with concept art, but was met with rejection. In order to pique the interest of studio executives, Jacobs needed to attach a movie star to the project. He ended up making an appointment with Charlton Heston, who was well known for his epics including The Ten Commandments and Ben-Hur. Luckily for Jacobs, Heston was intrigued by the project. Novel. Planet of the Apes, and a remarkable series of paintings of scenes in the picture that uh, Arthur envisioned. And it attracted me. I liked the idea of the talking monkeys and the different civilization, and it was simply a marvelous idea for a movie. With Heston on board, he recommended director Franklin J. Schaffner, and they tried to pitch this to many studios to less than enthusiastic responses. And he would go from studio to studio, and they would say, what are you talking about? Spaceships? Talking monkeys? You're out of your mind. That's Saturday morning cereals. Get out of here. However, there was a light at the end of the tunnel when they managed to get the attention of Richard Zanuck, president of 20th Century Fox, and were able to pitch it to him. He had reservations, however. Dick Zanuck said, uh, these monkeys, they're really going to be actors, right, in makeup, not real monkeys. We said, well, sure, of course. And he said, uh, what if people laugh at the makeups? You know, it could be some very humorous uh, idea, if not done properly. And I asked him um, to make this test. Zanuck wanted a test made, showing the apes in makeup. A jury rig set with actors including Heston himself as Thomas the Astronaut, Hollywood legend Edward G. Robinson as Dr. Zayas, with James Brolin and Linda Harrison as Drs. Cornelius and Zira, respectively. Good. Some of us will be returning to the city. This gives me an opportunity to say goodbye. Won't you be coming back here to the excavations? You won't be returning to the city built and filled by a civilized race, a race which, according to you, never got beyond a crawl and a couple of grunts. You found more than a cemetery, Doctor. You found a question. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, the ape or the man? The makeup, very primitive for what the actual film would show, proved that the concept can work and audiences will be able to take a movie like this seriously, and as a result, Zanuck greenlit Planet of the Apes. Certain challenges arose with the question of the ape makeup and setting. The setting was changed at the behest of director Franklin Schaffner. The novel showed a technologically advanced ape society with futuristic cars and helicopters, with Rod Serling's script being faithful in that regard, but would cause the production to go over budget. The early designs were very high-tech civilization, which meant you had to design all kinds of special vehicles and so on, and buildings. And Frank said, he said, that's gonna, I don't have enough budget as it is. He said, why don't we say it's a very primitive society? And they use horse and wagons and uh, very primitive buildings, and that's what we did. As a result of the changes made to Ape Society, Jacobs hired Michael Wilson to rewrite Serling's script to the primitive setting. Mike Wilson did a rewrite, which was very close to being right. We were already dealing with a science fiction central idea. And I had learned, because I'd done a lot of science fiction things on television, that you cannot present too many science fiction ideas and have them work unless you had characters, believable human or characters with human responses. And we couldn't contain all of the science fiction that Pierre had envisioned, and we had to simplify it. The makeup was handled by prosthetics expert John Chabers, who worked on other science fiction shows and even designed Mr. Spock's ears from the original Star Trek. 
he had to design appliances that could transform many human beings into walking, talking apes. The appliances worked more with the facial muscles showing the animation through the actor creating the overextensive smile or talk. What resulted from all this work and perseverance on the part of the production team, the film, known as Planet of the Apes, landed in theaters in 1968. From here on out, I will be going into spoiler territory, so click out now if you still haven't seen this. Believe me, it's worth it. Planet of the Apes opens on a spaceship going at a speed close to the speed of light. As a result, time moves differently on Earth as opposed to those on the ship. We meet Colonel Taylor, the commander of the mission, six months out of Cape Kennedy, in deep space, giving a final report to whoever may be listening due to the dilation effect resulting in all the suits that sent him upon the stars are long dead and possibly forgotten. Taylor comes off as a man with no regrets, leaving everything and everyone he knew behind forever. Due to space being boundless, he feels small and alone, but still poses the following questions. Does man, that marvel of the universe, that glorious paradox who sent me to the stars, still make war against his brother, keep his neighbor's children starving? He joins his crew in hibernation, and we get the opening credits to Planet of the Apes. The visuals for the opening credits show what looks to be galaxies moving across the screen as we hear Jerry Goldsmith's experimental soundtrack providing an out-there, alien-sounding arrangement. This avant-garde arrangement was put together by unorthodox means including horns blown without mouthpieces, the use of an echoplex looping the drums while adding steel mixing bowls as percussion instruments, and the orchestra used to imitate ape grunting sounds. We see a first-person view of the ship as it is flying down onto an unknown planet. Whoops, the ship crashes into the water. Taylor and the crew awakens with beards, but unfortunately, one of them didn't make the trip. Water starts gushing in, so Taylor orders his men to send a signal, read the atmosphere, blow the hatch, and escape on a life raft. Taylor does, however, have time to read the Earth date, revealing the year is in fact 3978 AD. They paddle to the nearest shore, while Taylor guesses that they are on an unnamed planet somewhere in the constellation of Orion, roughly 300 light years from Earth. Landon thinks the sun could be Bellatrix, but none of them know for sure. They arrive on shore to find nothing but desert as far as the eyes can see. Dodge runs soil tests as Taylor checks their supplies, which turns out to be three days of food and water. Taylor breaks it to Dodge and Landon that they are displaced 2,000 years Earth time, which Landon himself isn't quite ready to accept, still viewing time dilation as only a theory. Taylor tells him he is one of the oldest humans in the universe and to accept it and live for the now or he might as well be dead. Landon states he's ready to die, if need be, with Taylor dismissing it, amused by the idea. <laughs> he's prepared to die. <laughs> Doesn't that make you misty? Chalk up another victory for the human spirit. Dodge reports that the soil here is no good, therefore they need to set out to find any source of life before their 72-hour window is up, with Taylor arbitrarily choosing which direction to go. Landon leaves a little memorial for Stuart with a U.S. flag, causing Taylor to laugh hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> they trek across the desert, going up and down plateaus, steep hills, encountering thunderstorms with no rain, large boulders rolling down towards them. They take a breather, where we get some more character moments, including Taylor trying to nail into his men's heads that they are here to stay and that they need to accept it. Dodge scouts out ahead while Taylor and Landon are behind. 
Getting to know each other, Taylor surmises that Landon was the golden boy of his graduating class and couldn't pass up an opportunity like this one to be a glorious American hero. In other words, achieve immortality. Landon confirms this, but he can't read Taylor. He sees Taylor as negative, a man who is no seeker, disliked mankind and used the mission as a way to run away. Taylor denies this and states he too is a secret, but his motivations are different. I can't help thinking somewhere in the universe there has to be something better than man. Dodge, being a true seeker who will risk his life to learn something new, discovers something. Where there's one, there's another. They continue to trek the desert following the flora while being watched by strange figures until they come across a warning. They pass the scarecrows and come across a waterfall in the pool, stripping naked and going for a swim. While they are enjoying the pool, they discover a footprint and notice their clothes and supplies are being taken. They follow a trail with their clothes and supplies destroyed and ultimately come across humanoids who are mute, eating off of the land. Taylor makes a comment about the humans. This is the best they've got around here. In six months, we'll be running this planet. A roar is heard from the forest. The humans try to flee the opposite way, but it's too late. They are cut off and surrounded by unseen figures on horseback who shoot the humans and throw nets, capturing whoever they can for the sport of it. The perpetrators are apes, mainly gorillas in their purple uniforms. Taylor and his men are caught up in this and try their best to flee, but fail. Dodge gets shot dead. Landon is knocked unconscious into the pool and captured, while Taylor gets shot in the neck, also falling into the same pool and also captured. Gorillas are carting off captured humans, including Taylor, while taking pictures of themselves with their human trophies. Smile. Holy crap, they can speak, let alone English on an unknown planet. Coincidence or intentional? Taylor is taken to Ape City, comes to, and finds himself in a vet's surgical lab being treated with his bullet wound to his neck. Here we meet Dr. Zera, played by Kim Hunter, who has a conversation with the veterinarian, Dr. Galen, both of whom are chimpanzees. We learn a bit about ape culture and how the higher-ups, the orangutans, look down their nose at chimpanzees but finds that their work may still have value to them. Dr. Galen is unhappy with his work and is jealous that Dr. Zira made it. The chief ape in these parts is Dr. Zayas. Yep, that one. Ooh, help me, Dr. Zayas! Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas! Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas! Oh, Dr. Zayas! Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas! Taylor listens to the conversation while receiving a blood transfusion from the female human he encountered before the hunt. He realizes the gorillas we saw earlier play the role of soldiers, hunters, and workers. The orangutans are the religious leaders, administrators, and politicians, with the chimpanzees playing the roles of scientists and doctors. Taylor recovers in a cage, unable to talk. Zira calls him Bright Eyes and takes great interest in Taylor as he tries to form words with his lips. Julius the turnkey thinks it's all pretend and dismisses Taylor's intelligence like this. You know what they say, human see, human do. Taylor attempts to steal Zira's notepad only to be knocked back in by Julius. Dr. Zayas, the Minister of Science played by Maurice Evans, arrives to evaluate Bright Eyes, with Zira beckoning him to speak. Zayas dismisses Taylor's attempts to speak and says this telling line. Man has no understanding. He can be taught a few simple tricks, nothing more. Zayas is obviously holding something back and is spooked about something. Will we, the viewer, find out what it is? Let's keep going. Zara gives Taylor a gift. The woman who donated her blood involuntarily, of course, as a potential mate. Taylor is now in an outside cage as we meet Zira's husband, Dr. Cornelius, played by Ape series staple Roddy McDowell. We get to see the actors awkwardly kiss with all the prosthetics in place. Zira tries to show Cornelius bright eyes, but Zayas is coming, 
something is up with him lately. Taylor tries to write letters in the sand as Zaius gives Cornelius a friendly warning not to bury his reputation as an archaeologist. Zaius wants to hold a meeting with Cornelius to know all the facts about the latter's upcoming expedition in order to sign off on it. Taylor's mate and another dumb human rub out the letters he made, starting a fight with the mail. The apes put a stop to it and burn Taylor with the torch, leash him, and take him back inside his cage in the research facility. The gorilla doesn't understand what Dr. Zero is trying to prove. That man can be domesticated. <laughs> Zaius sees the letters in the sand, looks around and immediately rubs them out. He knows something. Taylor, back in his cage, attempts to take Zero's notepad and marker again and succeeds only to be beaten in consequence by Julius. She gets her pad back, but this time with the words, my name is Taylor written on them. Zero commands Julius to release Taylor to her custody. Inside the home of Cornelius and Zira, Taylor explains in writing who he is and where he came from, explaining the nature of spaceflight and his journey across the desert known to the apes as the Forbidden Zone. Cornelius, initially skeptical, questions where Taylor learned to write and doesn't believe that Taylor actually trekked through the Forbidden Zone due to his own experiences there. Here, we learn that Cornelius developed a hypothesis that the ape evolved from a lower order of primate, perhaps even man, after discovering traces of a culture older than recorded time. We learn that the Academy and Dr. Zaius view that idea as heresy, with the reason being their discovery could prove that the ape's religious texts, the sacred scrolls, would not be worth their parchment. Dr. Zaius arrives, accompanied by guerrilla soldiers, and Dr. Maximus, the Commissioner for Animal Affairs, played by Woodrow Parfrey, before he was cooking hot dogs for Dirty Harry. I guess Cornelius kind of forgot about his appointment with Zaius. Zaius is spooked by a discovery. A toy. It floats on the air. Try it. Nonsense. What does he know? Taylor, back in his cage, overhears the soldiers telling Julius that they're going to have him taken to be gelded. As Julius tries to leash him, Taylor attacks him, knocking him unconscious, and escapes the research center. He tries to flee through the city, but the local civilians scream, causing him to hide inside a church. We hear an ape eulogy for a recently departed gorilla. But he is discovered by a gorilla child. It's a man! In heaven's name, get rid of that creature! The gorilla soldiers try to catch him on horseback with nets, a leash, but he's able to fight them off. The chase leads to Taylor hiding in a museum filled with displays of stuffed humans. He eludes the soldiers but runs into a mother and her child while discovering a familiar display. Taylor is chased outside. He gets lassoed and frees himself, manages to catch a whip, pulling the ape off the horse, but the chimpanzee civilians join the fight and throw food and other objects at him distracting him so the gorillas toss a net on him and capture him. Zira fights with the soldier over his custody, but Taylor has something to say about that. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! Taylor, back in his cage, names the woman Nova and tries to teach her to speak to no avail. The apes come back and separate the two of them while Julius unleashes the blast of a hose at Taylor, making me not think of any true events. Taylor says another iconic line. It's a man -house! A man -house! After Taylor telling Nova about the women on Earth, the gorillas take him to a hearing chamber where he is forced to stand as Cornelius, Zira, a prosecutor named Dr. Honorius, played by James Daly, probably around the time he played Flint in Star Trek, and the Tribunal of the National Academy that includes an Academy president played by James Whitmore, Dr. Zaius, and Dr. Maximus. Here we learn that Zaius is not only the Minister of Science, but he's also the Chief Defender of the Faith. Hmm. They strip Taylor of his dignity, or in other words, his smelly clothes. Zira and Cornelius beg the question on A, the purpose of this inquiry, 
and B, whether there is a charge against Taylor. Honorius answers B. Zaius answers A. Scientific heresy that is being tried here. Zara and Cornelius endanger their careers by defending Taylor, so he requests to defend himself, but he gets treated like an animal and silenced. The prosecution states their case, revealing the ape's first article of faith, that the Almighty created the ape in his own image, given a soul and a mind, that he set him apart from the beasts of the jungle and made him Lord of the planet. I honestly cannot explain why this sounds so familiar. The place we're going is Genesis. Genesis? Honorius claims that the study of apes is apes, and that the subversiveness of the young apes in the study of man in advancing an insidious theory known as evolution has led to the charge of Zira and Dr. Galen from earlier tampering with the brain and throat tissues to create a speaking monster. Zira argues that Taylor can think, he can also reason. Honorius uses a flawed direct examination to expose that Taylor has no soul by asking a series of questions about ape culture which Taylor can obviously not answer. Taylor puts in a statement to the tribunal about who he is and where he came from and also that he had two companions with him. The survivors of that great hunt are gathered outside, so they go out and have Taylor point out his companion. He sees Landon, goes up to him, only to find a C-shaped scar on the side of his head. Oh crap. Taylor knows exactly who was behind this. You did it. You cut up his brain, you bloody baboon! Taylor gets dragged back inside. Zaius claims that Landon suffered a skull fracture and that two surgeons under his direction saved the life, but denies that he ever spoke, nor will he ever speak. Taylor is livid. You did that to him, damn you! You cut out his memory, you took his identity, and that's what you want to do to me! He gets gagged. Damn you! Cornelius denies Taylor being from another planet, but confirms that he did come from the Forbidden Zone, revealing to the Tribunal that he has actually been there. Cornelius brings up his hypothesis and that the existence of Taylor supports it, with Zera bringing up that there is no physical reason why humans are mute. Cornelius describes man just how Taylor described them in the very beginning. This marvel, this living paradox, this missing link in the evolutionary chain. Zaius moves to indict Cornelius and Zera for scientific heresy. Taylor is dragged to Dr. Zaius's office. He reveals that Taylor did the state a favor by helping them expose Cornelius and Zera. Taylor, now in Zaius's custody, is in for final disposition meaning Taylor is to be gelded and also subjected to experimental brain surgery like Landon earlier. A living death, if you will. Zaius, however, promises a reprieve if Taylor can tell him who he truly is and where others like him can be found, not believing he's from outer space and also not believing he's a monster created by Dr. Zera. Zaius, calling him Taylor, begs the question of whether or not there is another jungle beyond the Forbidden Zone and threatens to strip Taylor of his identity if he doesn't answer. Taylor is given six hours to confess and is taken back to his cage. A young chimpanzee named Lucius poses as a representative of the circus to bust Taylor out. Julius just can't get a break, I see. Taylor takes Nova with despite the young chimp's objections and they go outside at night to meet up with Zira. They ride off and meet up with Cornelius near the hunting grounds where Taylor was captured earlier. Taylor asserts himself, stating the apes are no longer in charge of him and has no intention of getting caught again and wants a firearm to defend himself. Taylor wants to see if there are more humans out there, with the apes wanting to prove their innocence, hence the trek. We backtrack the path Taylor was on earlier, seeing the scarecrows again and the desert. A river that empties into the sea leads to the archaeological dig, and we learn that no one truly knows why the Forbidden Zone is named, but it is ancient taboo set forth in the sacred scrolls by the ancient lawgiver, declaring this place deadly. They head down following the river until they arrive at the dig. Taylor uses this opportunity to shave. The apes are like, why? I'm just curious where he got the shaving cream and the razor from. Taylor states only kids where he comes from have beards. 
They attempt to enter the cave, when Dr. Zaius and a contingent of guerrilla soldiers catch up with them, placing them all under arrest, causing Taylor to engage the guerrillas. He threatens to shoot Zaius if they don't withdraw. They oblige. Zaius threatens to execute Cornelius and Zira for Taylor's actions, but Taylor only mocks him in this position. Taylor and Zaius come to an arrangement where the latter will entertain the evidence in the cave and if Cornelius can prove his hypothesis correct, will be let off of the heresy charge. Inside the cave, Cornelius presents Zaius with a series of evidence that includes a human doll found next to the jawbone of a man. Zaius dismisses this since apes used to keep humans as pets until their lawgiver put a stop to that claiming man cannot be tamed with Zaius' own granddaughter having a human doll. Taylor reconstructs a past life finding false teeth, eyeglasses, and a prefabricated valve for a bad heart. Nova accidentally causes the doll to say, Mama, leading to an inevitable conclusion. Dr. Zaius, would an ape make a human doll? Gunshots! The gorillas are back and fighting Lucius over his gun, hitting him. The gorillas try to shoot Taylor from above and below. Taylor dispatches them and gets one but is at a disadvantage, so he holds Zaius hostage and again forces them to withdraw. Taylor sends Lucius to the gorillas with demands for a horse, food, and drink for a week, and ammunition. Taylor ties Zaius up despite Cornelius and Zira's objections. Taylor gloats at Zaius, stating that ape culture owes its existence to man and reveals to the scientists that Zaius knew about man all along. Zaius and Cornelius read the 29th scroll, 6th verse, a warning to all apes about the nature of man who kills indiscriminately and to keep them under control or they will make a desert of his home and theirs. In other words, harbingers of death. Zaius's views towards man have not changed. Lucius comes back with a horse and the supplies that Taylor demanded. Taylor intends to continue to follow the coastline and his nose with Nova while the apes feel this is foolhardy, doubting his survival. The apes begin their goodbyes to Taylor. Cornelius thanks him for proving their innocence. Lucius still thinks Taylor is making a mistake, which Taylor respects and gives him some free speech movement era advice. Remember, never trust anybody over 30. For all she's done for him, Taylor says an affectionate goodbye to Zero. All right, but you're so damned ugly. Taylor has one final conversation with Dr. Zayas. He asks why Dr. Zayas fears and hates him. Because you're a man. Zaius further reiterates his feelings on man, who has the need to make war with everything around him, including himself. Taylor states there were no weapons in that cave, to which Zaius reveals a past transgression. The Forbidden Zone was once a paradise. Your greed made a desert of it. Despite Zaius' warning not to look for the answer, Taylor proceeds to leave and departs. The moment he does, the gorillas charge right back in the scene with the chimpanzees freeing Zaius from his blinds. Zaius allows Taylor to go, but reneges on his promise to let Cornelius and Zira off by sealing the cave, destroying the proof, and still having them stand trial for heresy. Zaius believes knowledge must stand still in order to, in his mind, save the future of ape society. The gorillas blow up the cave. Taylor and Nova continue down the shoreline to an atmospheric soundtrack in the sound of the waves. They come across a large, familiar structure on the beach, causing Taylor to look up and dismount. In one of the biggest twists in cinematic history, Charlton Heston as Taylor makes the unexpected discovery that he is in fact back home on Earth. Without explicitly telling the audience, Taylor knows exactly what happened and gives off this unforgettably chilling monologue. You maniacs! You blew it up! God damn you all to hell! The camera reveals the remains of the Statue of Liberty, telling the audience that Taylor is truly alone in the universe 
and that mankind has indeed destroyed themselves in nuclear war. The lack of music and the continual sound of the tides provides a chilling and indifferent attitude from the earth as it continues to be without human civilization. I remember first seeing this ending as a fifth grader and did not quite understand at first who Taylor was yelling at. I initially thought it was the apes at first, but after I rented it and watched it again, I figured it out. Even as a child, I knew this ending was more open-ended, so I went to my dad and asked if they came out with sequels to this. My dad, who was the age I was when the original film came out, told me that there indeed were, so I went ahead and rented them, but that will be another subject for another retrospective. I loved everything about Planet of the Apes. Charlton Heston as the film's leading man gave probably his most iconic performance of his life, with so many quotable moments from It's a Madhouse, to damn you all to hell, to get your stinking paw off me, you damn dirty ape. Heston's character of Taylor starts the movie disillusioned by humanity, believing to be something better out there, only to find himself in a much worse position under ape society only for him to escape and to fall into despair after learning that humanity ultimately destroyed themselves. Taylor, abandoning humanity, learned the hard way that there is an existence for man out there that is worse than how he left it. And we also learn that despite his disillusionment, despite his claim to simply live in the here and now and not look back, the end of the film is very telling it for how this character truly feels because whether or not he wants to admit it, humanity is still the core of his identity that he will always carry with him, and to lose that is beyond even my imagination. All the ape actors provide amazing performances as well, being overexpressive to compensate for all the makeup and truly transforming themselves into their talking primate characters. When I was real young and getting glimpses of this movie, I honestly thought the apes were real, and they could somehow talk and it easily allowed me as an older viewer even to this very day, to suspend my disbelief and truly be entertained by the actors' performances. The primitive sets looked alien and fitting for the ape culture, despite their advanced knowledge of law, religion, science, medicine, and military duty. Obviously, this film is filled to the brim with allegory reflecting the 1960s. Taylor, as an embittered man, disillusioned with humanity, leaves for greener pastures just to find a society run by apes, no different from humanity. Ape society is a reflection of our own, with treating man as the lowest form of life, equivalent to how we have been unscrupulous in causing the extinction of many species over several centuries. The apes are in a caste system, with the orangutans on the top who look down upon the more pacifistic chimpanzees, while the gorillas act as the muscles for them. Ape society has their own judicial system and will hold hearings and inquiries following a very familiar judicial procedure based on screenwriter Michael Wilson's experiences being blacklisted by the House Committee of Un-American Activities. The prosecutor, Dr. Honorius, accusing the chimpanzees of embracing evolution over religion makes me think of the John Scopes monkey trial where Scopes, a teacher, was put on trial for teaching the theory of evolution in Tennessee, with Howard Hamlin's favorite historical attorney, Clarence Darrow, defending Scopes and bringing national awareness to the evolution versus religion debate. The idea was further shown in a Star Trek Voyager episode where a scientist from an alien race 65,000 light years from Earth finds evidence that causes him to hypothesize that they are descendants of the dinosaurs of Earth and manages to get Commander Chakotay from the USS Voyager to help prove his case before the hierarchy. Unfortunately, like Planet of the Apes, the hierarchy won't go against doctrine and threaten to enslave the crew of Voyager if the alien scientist does not back down his claims. An episode a lot of fans did not like, Distant Origin, but one that I found very intriguing and was disappointed that episode was never followed up on. Planet of the Apes has been very influential in our pop culture, like the Star Trek Voyager episode I mentioned just now. Well, another great show, The Simpsons, celebrates Planet of the Apes in multiple ways, including crafting a live Broadway musical. I see from chimpanzee to chimpanzee. The kids trying to avoid going to church. And what Homer thinks right before going into outer space. Wait a minute, Statue of Liberty. That was our planet! Damn you! 
Planet of the Apes references are riddled throughout the series, and I challenge you to spot them all. The Planet of the Apes film is a streamlined version of the original Pierre Boulle book, La Planet des Sanges, with some similarities, but a hell of a lot more differences. The story begins with a prologue and an epilogue featuring a rich couple, Jin and Phyllis, sailing in outer space that find a manuscript in a floating bottle. The manuscript is written by the protagonist, Ulysse Miro, accounting his adventure. Moreau was invited by a professor to accompany him and a physician on an interstellar trip to the star Betelgeuse. Time dilation happens and they land on a planet, but this time land in the forest on a planet called Soror. Lots of the same stuff happens. The mute humans, the hunt, the characters Nova, Cornelius, Zera, and Zaius have equivalent roles, but the similarities end here. Ape society is high tech with futuristic vehicles. The apes wear gloves instead of boots for their feet. They speak a simian language, whereas our protagonist speaks mainly French, so he has to learn the language in order to communicate with the apes. Instead of the heresy hearing in front of the academy, Ulysse speaks for himself at a conference at the Scientific Congress where he gains popular support amongst the ape population. Things, however, go downhill when Ulysse gets Nova pregnant and they give birth to a baby boy, Sirius who can talk, spooking the apes, concerned about Ulysse populating the world with talking humans. Cornelius and Zera get wind of an ape conspiracy to put the family to death, or worse. So they help them escape to a spaceship, since like the movies, all humans look alike to most apes. They travel for two years in space with centuries passing on Earth, only for them to return to Paris, and the people to receive them there after all this time, are in fact, gorillas. The other twist here is that in the prologue, Jin and Phyllis, the space travelers, are also in fact, apes. However, this time, they're chimpanzees. As you can tell by my simple summary, a very different story that would be almost impossible to adapt for film. My summary does not do the story justice, and I suggest you check out the original Boole novel at your leisure. Plan of the Apes was successful in the box office, to the praise of adults for the intellectual questions and dialogue, and children alike for the action, the imaginative set design, and character makeup. John Chambers won the Academy Award for the Outstanding Makeup, and Goldsmith and Hack were nominated for original score and costume design, respectively. The movie managed to make a large profit, leading to the birth of one of the earliest film franchises. Four sequels were produced annually, by Apjack Productions, starting with Beneath the Planet of the Apes, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, and the finale, Battle for the Planet of the Apes. A live-action television series with the same name, Planet of the Apes, was produced, after which lasted half a season, repurposing the setting of the first film. We also have an animated series, Return to the Planet of the Apes, a remake in 2001, also called Planet of the Apes, by Tim Burton, starring Mark Wahlberg. And finally, a reboot trilogy featuring Andy Serkis playing the chimpanzee, Caesar. I have still not seen the two television series, but all the films are worth the watch, even the Tim Burton remake. The original film, despite its overwhelming praise, is not without its own flaws. The obvious flaw is that most people feel that the name itself, as iconic as it is now, sounded like something that a B-movie would be called and would likely deter audience and critics, according to Roger Ebert. Another issue I have is that Taylor not once considered the fact that he could have been on Earth due to the similar atmosphere, landscapes, gravity, and that the planet has species just like Earth, apes and humans and who knows what else. I also feel Zera and Cornelius were too naive taking the word of Dr. Zaius, who was against them ever since Zera showed interest in Taylor, especially when he is the chief defender of the faith as well as the minister of science. There are some of those on the nose moments I mentioned earlier, including quoting the Berkeley free speecher Jack Weinberg's famous never trust anybody over 30, and obviously copying human truths and sayings and replacing the word man with ape. These are typical nitpicks that I think that, in my opinion, don't detract from the movie personally, and I actually find them amusing, but 
things I think could have been handled slightly better. Roger Eber himself said Planet of the Apes is nothing significant and just a fun romp that could be taken as a high-budget Twilight Zone episode. Boy, I don't agree with that. The movie was very significant in the grand scheme of things ultimately, but hey, it's still his take of the time and I can see where he was coming from. Let me know your thoughts and feelings on the film in the comments below. Planet of the Apes is one of the earliest science fiction films I saw as a child. One of the few, the others being the original Star Trek, and the movies like The Day of the Earth Stood Still, 2001, and many others connected me to an earlier era of entertainment, one that my parents grew up around, with apes being one of my dad's favorites as a kid. The lived-in world, the practical effects, the iconic dialogue, and the impeccable ape makeup made the world of Planet of the Apes a very believable world that still entertains people to this day, 54 years later. Despite the allegory and some of the on-the-nose dialogue that fits with the time the film came out, it gave me an open window in understanding humanity in the 1960s with all the heavy issues they faced with ape society once again being a mirror to our own. The threat of the apes and how they managed to continually subdue Charlton Heston's Taylor character showed audiences that the apes were not dopes and were super intelligent, cunning, and very threatening to man. Taylor was not able to beat them alone, but with the help of friendly apes who were interested in learning not only about themselves, but also man, who they owe their entire civilization and culture to. Whether or not, due to Serling's writing, you think Planet of the Apes is just a high-budget episode of The Twilight Zone is up to you. But think of it. The Twilight Zone is one of the greatest science fiction shows of all time. So that to me is hardly a criticism, but more of a compliment. The actors in the ape costumes and makeup provided believable characters who took the viewer out of his or her shell and landed in the world of the apes along with Taylor, Landon, and Dodge. Dialogue delivery from the series staple Roddy McDowell, Kim Hunter, and Maurice Evans are some of the most memorable along with the overexpression to compensate for the heavy appliance of the makeup. The final part of the movie always gets me thinking of the future of humanity on whether we will continue to grow and take our place in the universe or we will simply destroy ourselves over our own petty issues with one another. Whatever it may be, Planet of the Apes is a mainstay in the science fiction genre that will spark many ideas and debates about mankind and the wacky idea of potentially sharing the world with another intelligent species. And as a species, I hope man will learn to be more open-minded and will work with others in the universe. If there is something or someone out there better than mankind, I hope we will one day learn from them so we don't end up like the humans in this cautionary tale. Thanks for watching this Planet of the Apes retrospective. If you made it this far and want to support further Nerporeal content, please hit the subscribe button, like the video, and ring the bell to receive notifications. Producing content has its costs, so other ways to support the channel is to check out my merch store at the nerdporeallifeform.com or to leave a simple donation. Other than that, here's a quick look at my next Nerdporeal film retrospective. The third planet around our sun, known as Sol, contains a secret that goes back several millennia. Was there something or someone out in the universe that was instrumental in mankind's development? What is this black monolith? Is it a teacher? Is it a beacon? Or is it a gator portal? Will the crew of the Discovery One mission learn the truth? More importantly, can you stay awake for the duration of this iconic Stanley Kubrick film? All this and more on the next Nerporeal Film Retrospective. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Will Hal approve of this retrospective and are my takes full of stars? Let's learn the truth and find out. <laughs>